So as Andy said, um, look, my interest is really in understanding how our brains interact with bacteria. And so tonight I want to talk about that in the context of our second brain, the gut, and some work in a mouse model of autism that we've been doing. So everybody knows uh, someone with autism is extremely common. The latest statistics suggest that uh, one to two percent of all school-aged children have been diagnosed with autism. So you'll all know that autism is diagnosed behaviourally and to get that diagnosis you need to have uh, deficits in social communication and you need to show repetitive and or restricted behaviours. Before you start thinking that, oh I might be on the spectrum, you have to have these traits at a level that's severe enough to impact on your everyday life. So you might not know that as well as these traits, most people with autism are dealing with a whole lot of other things that are going on. But we're particularly interested in looking at the gut problems. And we now know that most people with autism actually experience uh, gut issues. And these can show up as con uh, constipation and uh, diarrhea, and these can be recurring on and off, uh, alternating. Abdominal bloating and pain, and even vomiting and regurgitation. And we don't really know what causes these, but we do know that in many cases of autism, and from our animal model work, the gut brain wiring is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit different. So you'd be familiar with the brain on the left, but you may not be so familiar with the nervous system that controls our gut. So when we look at, the, at this brain, the central nervous system, you can see, and you will have seen these kind of images before, that there are a beautiful organisation of different subtypes of neurons. They're labelled by different fluorescent labels here, all organised from the outside of the brain down to the inner region. And you don't see it in this slide, but there are lots of branches and processes connecting these neurons so that they can talk to each other in that way. Guess what? The gut has a similar nervous system. In red here, you see these cell bodies, and they're basically the same building blocks, the same units. These neurons are really complex. And here, though, you can see the branches, the processes from the neurons that are connected to each other. And so one of the main ways that neurons communicate with other, each other is by these junctions called synapses. And in this region, there are thousands of molecules that help the synapses stay stuck together. It's kind of like the Velcro of the nervous system. And we're really interested in my lab in studying these. In this diagram of a synapse, you can see a lot of the names of these molecules in red. And they're the ones that have already been identified as gene mutations in patients with autism. And we're really interested in studying this pathway here, and in particular, one of the genes in this family. So what we do next in our lab, and this is a common procedure. We take mice that have already had the gene mutation found in patients put into the, their um, DNA sequence. And then we can take the gut, for example, and study that and see how that might be changed in the presence of this autism mutation. And one of the ways we can do this is take the colon of a mouse, and that's what you're looking at here. You're looking down on a colon. It's about five centimetres long. It's detached from the main brain. And you can see it's contracting quite happily on its own, spontaneously, regular contractions. And it stays alive and does this for over three hours. So you can see it started up here in the oral region and this contraction continues down to the anal area. And this gut is basically tied to a tube, which is out of the frame of the picture. And you'll see it's starting to dilate here in the oral region now. And you probably saw some content before, that's, that's some microbes that were in the gut and they're gonna get flushed back there. So what we can do with this system, these are really well characterised uh, contractions. We can add some drugs that we know specifically act on the neurons in the gut, and then we can measure what happens, what happens to the contractions, and that might tell us about what's changed in the nervous system. So rather than watch all of those videos again and again and try to remember what was different, we have a system where we can take each frame of the video and for each area that's contracted we can assign warm coloured pixels and for the regions of the gut that are dilated we can assign cool colours. And then we can make a summary map of that experiment. So say the experiment began here and it finished at 15 minutes down here and each of those red stripes 
is one of those contractions that you just saw in the video. So what we find is quite often when we add some of the drugs to our control normal mice, their maps look very nice like this with clear contractions. But then in some of the experiments when we use our autism mouse model, which has just one gene mutation, a point mutation found in patients, we have the same drug, and you see the contraction patterns are really different. And so this is a mutation that we thought, oh yeah, this affects the brain, but it's actually affecting the gut as well. Remember, it's separated from the central nervous system. So maybe this is telling us something about autism patients and why they might have gastrointestinal problems in some cases. <clears throat> so, for many, many decades, we've been studying the nervous system, but we've kind of ignored what the microbes might be doing. So, that's not the case anymore, but we did a quick look in our autism mice and tried to remove some of the environmental factors that we often have in, in clinical studies. What we did is we took our control, normal mice, they're shown in orange here, we put them in the same cage as their litter mates that had the mutation. So the background genes of these mice are identical. They're identical twins, except for this point mutation found in patients with autism. We took some of their microbes, and we were really surprised to see that some microbes were found only in the mice with the autism mutation, and some were found only in the control mice. And then we could sequence these microbes and find out which ones were actually changed. So it's nice to be able to relate what we do in animals to clinical studies. And so that's what we wanted to do. <coughs> but unfortunately, it's not very clear at the moment. It's really messy. There are about 15 studies looking at microbes in autism patients versus controls. And pretty much all of them show a change, which is great, but pretty much all of them show a different change. So we're kind of at the beginning of this era. But just to give you a quick idea, some people think that there's a change in the ratio of different types of bacteria. A couple of studies, although from the same lab, show an increase in specific types of bacteria. But really, we're just starting to figure out what is a healthy profile for, microbi for our microbiomes and what might be changed in a disease or a, a neurodevelopmental disorder context. But I think the next big step is going to be thinking about how can we modulate microbes to improve health. So even in the context of a genetic mutation, which is pretty tough to amend at the moment, we might be able to improve quality of life, um, mood and behaviour, and even gastrointestinal function if we can figure out which microbes um, might be detrimental and to be able to target them. So thanks very much.